The Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14b. Girt about with truth. Chapter 13. A word of direction to those who, upon trial, are found unsound and false-hearted. Having laid down characters of the sincere heart, it will be necessary to make some improvement of them, as the report shall be that conscience makes in your bosoms upon putting yourselves to the trial of your spiritual states by the same. Now, the report that conscience makes after examination of yourselves by those notes prefixed will amount to one of these three inferences. Either it will condemn thee for a hypocrite or pronounce thee a sincere Christian, or thirdly, bring in an ignominious, and heave thee in doubt whether thou art sincere or not, that I may therefore find thee, reader, at one door, if I miss thee at another, I shall speak severally to all three. First, to such who upon trial are cast, evidence comes in so clear and strong against them that their conscience cannot hold, but tells them plainly, if these be the marks of sincerity, then they are hypocrites. The improvement I would make of this trial, for your sakes, is to give a word of counsel what in this case you are to do that you may become sincere. First, get thy heart deeply affected with the, thy present dismal state. No hope of cure till thou art chaffed into some sense of feeling of thy deplored condition. Physic cannot be given so long as the patient is asleep. It is the nature of the disease to make the soul heavy-eyed and dispose it to a kind of slumber of conscience by reason of the flattering thoughts the hypocrite hath of himself. From some formalization, he per performs above others in religion, which fume up from his deceived heart, like so many pleasing vapors, from the stomach to the head, and bind up his spiritual senses into a kind of stupidity, yea, cause many pleasing dreams to entertain him with vain hopes and false joys, which vanish as soon as he wakes and comes to himself. The Pharisees, the most notorious hypocrites of their age, how fast asleep were they in pride and carnal confidence, despising all the world in comparison of themselves, not afraid to com commend themselves to God, yea, prefer themselves before others. God, I thank thee, I am not like this publican. As if they would tell God they did not, that they did look to find some more respect from him than others so far beneath them had at his hand. Therefore Christ, in his dealing with this proud generation of men, useth an unusual strain of speech. His voice, which to others was still and soft, is heard like thunder breaking out of the clouds when he speaks to them. How many dreadful claps have we almost together in the same chapter fall on their heads, out of the mouth of our meek and sweet Savior, Matthew chapter 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees! No less than eight woes doth Christ discharge upon them, as so many case shot together, that by multiplying the woes he might show not only the certainty of the hypocrite's damnation, but precedency also. And yet how many of that rank do we read of to be awakened and converted by these sermons? Some few there were indeed that the disease might appear not incurable, but very few, that we may tremble the more of falling into it or letting it grow upon us. Peter learned of his master how to handle the hypocrites who, having to do with one far gone in this disease, Simon Magnus, uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 21, he steeps his words, as it were, in vinegar and gall. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. There he lays the weight of his charge that he carried a hypocritical heart in his bosom, which was a thousand times worse than his simonical, S-I-M-O-N-I-A-C-A-L, fact. Though that was foul enough, it was not barely that fact, but proceeding from a heart inwardly rotten and false, which God gave Peter an extraordinary spirit to discern, that proved him to be in the gall of bitterness and bond of iniquity. Only in this better than the damned souls in hell that were in the fire, he in the bond of iniquity, like a faggot bound up, fit for it, but, in, but not in cast in. They passed hope, and he so much left as might amount 
to a perhaps if the thought of his heart might be forgiven. To give but one instance more, and that is the whole church, hypocritical Laodicea. The Spirit of God takes her up more sharply than all the rest, which, though he charged with some particular miscarriages, yet finds something among them he owns and commends. But in her, because she was conceited already as this leaven of hypocrisy naturally puffs up, he mentions nothing that was good in her, lest it should feed that humor that did so abound already and take away the smartness of the reproof, which was the only probable means left of recovering her. All that inclines to sleep is deadly to a lethargic, and all that is suited in conquering, conquering dangerous to hypocrites. Some say the surest way to cure a lethargic is to turn it into a fever. To be sure, the safest way to deal with a, the hypocrites is to bring them from their false peace to a deep sense of their true misery. Let this, then, be thy first work. Ag aggregate thy sin and put thy soul into mourning for it. When a person who was by the priest, who was to judge in case of leprosy, pronounced unclean, the leper, thus convert, convicted, was to rend his clothes, go bareheaded, and put a covering upon his upper lip. All ceremonies used by mourners and to cry, unclean, unclean. Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45. Thus do thou, as a true mourner, sit down and lament the plague of thy heart, cry out bitterly, unclean, unclean I am, not fit by reason of thy hypocritical heart to come near God or his saints, but to be like the leper, separate from both. If thou hast such a loathsome disease reigning on thee as did pollute the very seat thou settest on, bed thou liest on, and drop such filthiness on everything that cometh near, even to the meat thou eatest and cup thou drinkest from, that should make all abandon thy company. How great would thy sorrow be, as thou didst sit desolate and musing alone of thy doleful condition. Such a state thy hypocrisy puts thee into, a plague it is, more offensive to God than such a disease could make thee to men. It runs like a filthy sore through all the duties and goodly coverings that you can put over it and defiles them in thee so that God will take an offering out of the devil's hand as soon as out of thine while thou continuest a hypocrite and did the saints of God with whom thou hast may, hast may be so much credit as to be admitted to join with them at present. Know thee, they would make as much haste from thee as from him on whom they should see the plague tokens. But should not thy disease be known till thou art dead, and so keep thy reputation with them, yea, possibly by them be thought, when thou diest a saint, will this give thee and any content in hell, that thou art speaking well of thee on earth? O poor Aristotle said one, Thou art praised where thou art not, and burnt where thou art. He meant it was poor comfort to that great heathen philosopher to be admired by men of learning that have kept up his fame from generation to generation, if he all the while be miserable in the other world. So here, O poor hypocrite, thou art ranked among saints on earth, but punished among the devils in hell. Secondly, when thy heart is deeply affected with the sin and misery of thy hypocritical heart, thou must be convinced of thy insufficiency to make a cure of thyself. Hypocrisy is like a fistula sore. It may seem a little matter by the small orifice it hath, but it is therefore one of the hardest among wounds to be cured, because it is hard to find the bottom of it. O oh, take heed, thy heart does not put a cheat upon thyself. It will be very forward to promise it will lie no more, be false and hypocritical no more, but take counsel of a wise man who bids thee not rely on what it saith. He is a fool that trusteth his own heart. Proverbs 28, verse 26. Oh, how many die because loth, loth to be at pains and cost to go to a skillful physician at first. Take heed of his self-resolutions and self-reformations. Sin is like the king's evil. God and not ourselves can cure it. 
he that will be tinkering with his own heart and not seek out to heaven for help will in the end find where he mends one hole he makes two worse where he reforms one sin he will fall into the hand of many more dangerous thirdly betake thyself to christ as the physician on whose skill and faithfulness thou wilt rely entirely for cure if thou perish resolve to perish at his door but for thy comfort know never any that he undertook miscarried under his hand nor ever refused he to undertake the cure of any that came to him on such an errand. He blamed those hypocrites, John 5, 40-43, because they were ready to throw away their lives by trusting in empiric and should come in his own name without any approbation or authority from God for the work, but would not come to him that they might have life, though he came in his father's name and had his seal and license to practice his skill on poor souls for their recovery. And he that blamed those for not coming will not, cannot be angry with thee who comest. It is his calling, and men do not use to thrust customer, customers out, but invite them into their shops. When Christ was on earth, he gave this reason why he conversed so much with publicans and sinners, and so little among the Pharisees, because there was more work for him. Matthew 9, 11 to 12. Men set up where they think uh, trade will be quickest. Christ came to be a physician to sick souls. Pharisees were so well in their own conceit that Christ saw he should have little to do among them. And so he applied himself to those who were more sensible of their sickness. If thou, poor soul, art but come to thyself so far as to groan under thy cursed hypocrisy and directest thy, these thy groans, in a prayer to heaven for Christ's help, thou shalt have thy physician soon with thee, never fear it. He hath not, since he ascended, laid down his calling, but still follows his practice as close as ever. We find him sending his advice from heaven in that excellent receipt, uh, Revelation chapter 3, to the Lady of Sia, what she should do for her recovery out of this very disease of hypocrisy. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, etc. As if he had said, Lady Asia, thou tradest in false ware, deceiving thyself and others with appearances for realities, counterfeit graces for true, thy gold is dross, thy garments rotten rags, which do not hide, but discover thy shame. Come to me, and thou shalt have that which is for thy turn, and better, cheap also. For though here is mentioned of buying, no more is meant than to come with a buyer spirit, valuing Christ and his gift, grace so high, that if they were to be bought, though with all the money in thy purse, yet blood in thy veins, thou wouldest have them, and not go home, and say thou, art, thou wert hard to use, it is the thirsty soul that shall be satisfied. Only look thy thirst be right and deep. First, right, a heart thirst, and not simply a conscience thirst. It is a very different heat that causes the one and the other. Hellfire may inflame the conscience as to make the guilty sinner thirst for Christ's blood to quench the torment which the wrath of God hath kindled in his bosom. But it is a heaven fire, and only that which begets a kindly heat in the heart that breaks out in the longings of soul for Christ in the spirit, with sweet coolings, dews of grace, to slack and extinguish the fire of lust and sin. Again, look it be deep. Physicians tell us of a thirst which comes from the dryness of the throat, and not only great inward heat of the stomach, and this thirst may be quenched with a gurgle in the mouth, which is spit out again and does not go down. And truly there is something like this in many that sit into the preaching of the gospel. Some light touches are now and then found upon the spirits of men and women, occasioned by some spark that falls on the, their affections in hearing the word, whereby they on a sudden express some desires after Christ and his grace that you would think they would in all haste for heaven, but being slightly fascist and weak valities, 
rather than strong volitions and deep desires, their heat is soon over and thirst quenched with the little present sweetness they taste when they are hearing a sermon of Christ, which they spit out again as soon as they are gone home almost, as well as may be, though they never enjoy more of him. Labor, therefore, for such a deep sense of thy own wretchedness by reason of thy hypocrisy and of Christ's excellency by reason of that fullness of grace in him which makes him able to cure thee of thy distemper, that as a man thoroughly a thirst can be content with nothing but drink, and not a little of that neither, but a full satisfying draught, whatever it cost him, so thou mayest not be bribed with anything besides Christ in his sanctifying grace, nor with gifts, professions, or pardons itself. If it could be severed with grace, no, not with a little sparkling of grace, but long for whole floods, wherewith thou mayest be fully purged and freed of thy cursed lust, which now so sadly oppresses thee. This frame of spirit would put thee under the promise of heaven's security, that thou shall, shalt not lose thy longing, if thou shouldest ask gold and silver and seek any worldly enjoyment at this rate, thou might, mightest spend thy breath and pains in vain. God might let thee roar like dives in hell in the midst of those flames which thou covetous lust had kindled, without affording a drop of that to cool thy tongue, which thou so violently pantest after. But if Christ and his grace be the things thou wouldst have, yea, must have truly then, Thou shalt have them. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. End of chapter 13. Having been read by Peter John Parisius. The Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14b. Gird thy lines. Chapter 14. An exaltation to those who upon trial are bound to be true in heart or sincere, to wear this belt gird close to them in the daily exercise of it, with the direction for that purpose. I come to the second sort, such I mean, whose consciences, upon diligent inquiry, give a fair testimony for their sincerity, that their hearts be true and upright. That which I have by way of counsel to leave with them is to gird this belt which they have about them close in the exercise and daily practice of it. Gird this belt, I say, close to thee. That is, be very careful to walk in the daily practice and exercise of thy uprightness. Think every morning thou art not dressed till this girdle be put on. The proverb is true here, ungirt, unblessed. Thou art no company for God that day in which thou art not sincere. If Abraham will walk with God, he must be upright, and canst thou live a day without his company? Rachel paid dear for her mandrates to part with her husband for them. A worse bargain that soul makes, that, to purchase some worldly advantage, pawns its sincerity, which gone, God is sure to follow after. And as thou canst not walk with God, so not expect any blessing from God, the promises, like a box of precious ointment, are kept to be broke over the head of the upright. Malachi 2, verse 7. Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly. Ensure it is ill walking in that way where there is found no word from God to bid us good speed. Some are so superstitious that if a hair crosseth them, they will turn back and go no further that day. But a bold man is he that dares go on when the word of God lies across his way. Where the word does not bless, it curses. Where it promises not, it threatens. Page 265. A soul in its uprightness proving itself to God is safe. Like a traveler going about his lawful business between sun and sun, if any harm or loss comes to such a soul, God will bear him out. The promise is on his side. By pleading it, he may recover his loss at God's hands, who stands bound to keep him harmless. See to this purpose. Psalms 84, verse 11. But they are directions not motives. I am in this place to give. Section 1. First, therefore, if thou wouldest walk in the exercise of thy sincerity, walk in the view of God. That of Luther is most true. All the commands are wrapped up in the first. For, saith he, all sin is a contempt of God, and so we cannot break any other commands, but we break the first. 
we think a mist of God before we do a mist against God. This God commended to Abraham as of a sovereign use to preserve his sincerity. Walk before me and be thou upright. Genesis chapter 17 verse 1. This kept Moses' girdle straight and close to his loins, that he was neither bribed with the treasures of Egypt, nor browbeaten out of his sincerity with the anger of so great a king. Hebrews 11.27 For he endured as seeing him who was invisible. He had a greater than Pharaoh on his eye, and this kept him right. First, walk Christian in the view of God's omniscience. That this is a girdling um, consideration. Say to thy soul, take heed, God see it. It is under the rose, as the common phrase is, that treason is spoken when subjects think they are far enough from the king's hearing. But did such know the prince to be under the window or behind the hangings, the discourse would be more loyal. This made David so upright in his walking. Psalms 119, verse 168. I have kept thy precepts for all thy ways that before thee. If Alexander's empty chair, which is captain's, when they meet in council set before them, did all them so as to keep them in good order, what would it for to set God looking on us in our eye? The Jews covered Christ's face and then buffeted him. Mark 14.65 So does the hypocrite. He first says in his heart, God sees not, or at least he forgets that he sees, and then makes bold to sin against him like that foolish bird which runs her head among the reeds and thinks herself safe from the fowler, as if because she did not see him, therefore he could not see her. I may hide thee from my eye, but not myself from thine. Thou mayest, poor creature, hide God by thy ignorancy and atheism, so that thou shalt not see him, but thou canst not, so as he shall not see thee. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. O remember thou hast to do with God in all thou doest, whether thou art in shop or closet, church or market, and he will have to do with thee, for he sees thee round, and can tell from whence thou comest. When, like Gehazi, before his master, thou enterest into his presence and standest demurely before him in his worship, as if thou hadst been nowhere, then he can tell thee thy thoughts, and without thy, any labor, of pumping them out by thy confusion, set them in order before thee, yea, thy thoughts that are gone from thee, like Nebuchadnezzar's dream from him, and thou hast forgot what they were at such a time and in such a place, forty, fifty years ago. God hath them all in the light of his countenance, as atoms are in the beams of the sun, and he can, yea, he will, give thee a sight of them, that they should walk in thy conscience to thy horror, as John the Baptist's ghost did in Herod's. Secondly, walk in the view of his providency and care over thee. When God bids Abraham be upright, he strengthens his faith on him. I am God Almighty, walk before me and be perfect, as if he had said, Act thou for me, and I will take care for thee. When once we begin to call his care in question towards us, then will our sincerity falter in our walking before him. Hypocrisy lies hid in distrust and jealousy, as in its cause. If the soul dare not reply, rely on God, it cannot be long true to God. Abraham was jealous of Amalek, therefore he disassembled with him. Thus do we with God. We doubt God's care, and then live by our wit and carve for ourselves. Up, make us God, say they. We know not what is become of Moses. The unbelieving Jews, flat against the command of God, kept manna until the moral, Exodus 16:19. And why? But because they had not faith to trust him for another meal. This is the old weapon the devil hath ever used to beat the Christian out of his sincerity with, page 266, Curse God and die, said he to Job by his wife, Job 2, nine, as if she had said, What, wilt thou yet hold the castle of thy sincerity for God? Captains think they may yield when no relief comes to them, and subjects make account. If the prince protect them not, they are not bound to serve him. Thou hast lain thus long in an afflicted state, besieged close with sorrows on every hand, and no news in this day comes from heaven of any care that God takes for thee. Therefore curse God and die. Yea, Christ had him 
using the same engine to draw him off from his faithfulness to his father. When he bade him turn stones into bread, we see therefore of what importance it is to strengthen our faith on the care and providence of God for our provision and protection, which is the cause why God hath made such abundant provision to shut all doubting and fear of this out of the hearts of his people. The promises are so fitly placed that as safe harbors upon what coast soever we be sailing, or what condition soever we are in, if any storm arise at sea or enemy chase us, we may put into some one or other of them and be saved, though this one were enough, could we find no more to serve our turn. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them, or strongly to hold with them, whose heart is perfect towards him. God doth not set others to watch, but his own eyes keep sentinel now to watch with the child. Like the own mother, there is the immediacy of his providency. We may say of sincere souls what is said of Cana, Deuteronomy 11, 9, and 10. It is a land, so they are a people. The Lord himself careth for, his eyes are always on them. Again, his eyes run to and fro. There is the vigilancy of his providency. No danger, no temptation finds him sleeping, but as a watchful, faithful watchman is ever walking up and down, so the eyes of God run to and fro. He that keep Israel, the sincere soul, which is the Israelite indeed, shall never slumber or sleep. Psalms 121, verse 4. That is not little or much, nor slumber by day, nor sleep by night. Two words are there used. One that signifies the short sleep used in the heat of the day, the other for the more sound sleep of the night. Thirdly, throughout the whole earth there is the universality and the extent of God's care. It is an encompassing providence. It walks the rounds, not any one sincere soul left out of the line of his care. He has a number of them to a man, and all are alike cared for. We disfigure the beautiful face of God's providence when we fancy him to have a cast of his eye and care to one more than another. Fourthly, he shows himself strong in behalf of them. There is the efficiency of his care and providence. His eyes do not run to and fro to eclipse dangers and only tell us what they are as the sunset wakes the city when an enemy comes but cannot defend them from their fury. A child may do this, yea, the geese did this for Rome's capital, but God watcheth, not to tell us our dangers, but to save us from them. The saints must needs be a happy people, because the people saved by the Lord, Deuteronomy 33.29. God doth not only see with his eyes, but also fights with his eyes. He gave such a look to the Egyptians as turned the sea on them to their destruction. Section 2. Secondly, labor to act from love and not fear. Slavish fear and sincerity cannot agree. If one be in the increase, the other is in the reign always. See them opposed. Second Timothy 1 7. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind. That is, sincere, where he implies that fear is weak and impotent, easily scared from God, his truth and service, and not so only, but unsound also, not trusting such a one with any great matter. The slave, though he works hard, because indeed he dares no other, yet is soon drawn into a conspiracy against his master, because he hates him while he fears him. We see this not only among the Turks, against whom those Christians used as absolute slaves by them in their galleries do, when they have advantage in fight, often purchase their own liberty by cutting the throats of their tyrant masters, but also in kingdoms where subjects rather fear than love their princes, how ready they are to invite another into the throne, or welcome any that should court them, thus fast and loose will he be with God that is pricked on with the sword's point of his wrath, and not drawn with the cords of his love. Israel is an example beyond parallel for this. When God slew them, they sought against him. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongue, for their heart was not right with him. Psalms 88, verses 34 and 35. They feared God and loved their lust, and therefore they betrayed his glory at every turn into their hands, as Herod did John's head, whom he feared into her hands, whom he loved. And truly there is too much of this slaver's fear to be found in the saints' bosoms, or else the whip should not be so often in God's hand. We find God checking his people for this and making their servile spirit the reason for his 
uh, severity towards them. Is Israel a slave, a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? Jeremiah 2.14. As if God had said, what is the reason that I must use this? Who art my dear child? As coarsely as if thou wert a servant, a slave, lying on blow after blow upon thy back with such heavy judgments. Wouldst thou know? Read verse 17. Hast thou not procured this to thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, when he led thee by the way? Thou mayest thank thyself for this, my unusual dealing with thee. If the child will forget his own ingenuity, and nothing but blows will work with him, then the father must deal with his child according to his servile spirit. When God led Israel by the way, as the father has his child lovingly, he flung with him, and if they would not lead by love, then no wonder he makes them drive by fear. O Christian, act more by love, and thou wilt save God's putting thee into fear with his whip. Love will keep thee close and true to him. The very character of love is, it seeks not her own. 1 Corinthians 13.5 And what is it to be sincere, but when the Christian seeks Christ's interest and not his own? Jonathan loved David dearly. This made him incur his father's wrath, trample on the hopes of a kingdom which he had for him and his posterity, rather than be false to his friend. Lot delivers up his daughters to the lust of sodomites, rather than his guests. Samson could not conceal that great secret from Delilah, whom he loved, wherein his strength lie, though it may as much as his life was worth to blab it to her. Love is the great conqueror of the world. Thus will thy soul, being inflamed with love to Christ, set all thy worldly interests adrift, rather than put his honor to the least hazard. Abraham did not more willingly put his sacrificing knife to the ram's throat to save his dear Isaac's life than that thou wilt be to sacrifice thy life to keep thy sincerity alive. Love is compared to fire the nature of which is to assimilate of it all that comes near it, or to consume them, it turns all into fire or ashes. Nothing that is heterogeneous can dwell with its own simple pure nature. Thus love to Christ may not suffer the near neighborhood of any in its bosom that is delegatory to Christ, whether it will reduce or abandon it, be it, it pleasure, profit, or whatever else. Abraham, who loved Hagar and Ishmael in their due place, when the one began to jostle with her mistress, and other dear and mock at Isaac, he packs them both out of doors. Love to Christ will not suffer thee to side with any of it, anything against Christ, but take his part with him against any that oppose him, and so long thy sincerity is out of danger. Section 3. Thirdly, meditate often on the simplicity and sincerity of God's heart to his saints. What more powerful consideration can be thought on to make us true to God than the faithfulness and trust of God to us? Absalom, though as vile a dissembler as lived, yet when Hushai came out to him, he suspected him, Second Samuel 16:17. And Absalom said to Hushai, Is this thy kindness to thy friend? Why wentest thou not out to thy friend? His own conscience told him that it was horrible baseness for him, that had found David such a true friend now to join in rebellious armies against him. And though Absalom, that said this, did offer greater violency to this law of love, yet he questioned, it seems, whether any durst be so wicked besides himself. When, therefore, Christian, thou findest thy heart warping into any insincere practice, lay it upon this consideration, if anything of God and his grace be in thee, it will unbend thee and bring thee to rights again. Ask thy soul. Is this thy kindness to thy friend, such a friend as God hath been, is, and surely will be, to thee forever? God, when his people sin, to put them to the blush, ask them whether he gives them any cause for their unkind and undutiful carriages to him. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me? Jeremiah 2, five. So Moses, intending to pay Israel home before he goes up and dies on Nebo, for all their hypocrisy, murmurings, and horrible rebellions against God, all along from first setting out of Egypt to that day, he brings to their, leaving off page 268, page 268, charge and draws out the several indictments that they were guilty of. Now, to add the greater weight to everyone, 
he in the forefront of all his speech shows what a God he is that they have done all this against. He makes way to the declaiming against their sins by the proclaiming of the gospel of God against whom they were committed. Deuteronomy 32 verse 3. I will publish the name of God, ascribe ye greatness to our God. And very observable it is what of God's name he publisheth the more to aggravate their sins and help them to conceive of their hideous nature. Verse 4. He is thy rock, his work is perfect, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. He chooses to instance in the truth and sincerity of God's heart to them in all his dispensations as that which might make them more ashamed of their doings. Now, because this one consideration may be of such use to hedge in the heart and keep it close to God in sincerity, I shall show wherein the truth and sincerity of God's love appears to his saints, every one of which will furnish us with a strong argument to be sincere and upright with God. First, the sincerity of God's heart appears in the principle he acts from and claims he acts at in all his dispensations. Love is the principle he is constantly acts from, and their good the end he propounds. From these he never swerves. The fire of love never goes out of his heart, nor their good out of his eye. When he frowns with his brow, chides with his lips, and strikes with his hand, even then his heart burns with love, and his thoughts meditate peace to them. Famous is that place for this purpose, Jeremiah 24, verse 5. I will acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. I will set my eyes on them for good, and this will, was one of the sharpest judgments God ever brought upon his people. And yet in this he is designing mercy and projecting how to do them good. So in the wilderness, when they cried out upon Moses for bringing them thither to kill them, they were more afraid than hurt. God wished them better than they dreamed of. His intent was to humble them that he might do them good in the latter end. So sincere is God to his people, that he gives his own glory in hostage to them for their security. His own robes of glory are locked up in their prosperity and salvation. He will not, indeed he cannot, present himself in all his magnificence and royalty till he hath made up his intended thoughts of mercy to his people. He is pleased to prorogue the time of his appearing in all his glory to the world till he hath actually accomplished their deliverance, that he and they may come forth together in the glory on the same day. Psalms 102 verse 16. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. The sun is ever glorious in the most cloudy day, but appears not so till it hath scattered the clouds that muffle it from the sight of the lower world. God is glorious when the world sees him not, but his decorative glory then appears when the glory of his mercy, truth, and faithfulness break forth in his people's salvation. Now, what shame must this cover thy face with, O Christian, if thou shouldest not sincerely aim at thy God's glory, who loves thee, yea, all his children so dearly, as to ship his own glory and your happiness in one bottom, that he cannot now lose the one and save the other? Secondly, the truth and sincerity of God to his people appears in the openness and plainness of his heart to them. A friend that is close and reserved deservedly comes under a cloud in the thoughts of his friend, that he who carries, as it were, a window of crystal in his breast, through which his friend may read what thoughts are writ in his very heart, delivers himself from the least suspicion of unfaithfulness. Truly, thus, open-hearted is God to his saints. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Psalms 25, verse 14. He gives us his key that will let us into his very heart and acquaint us with his thoughts are, yea, were towards us before a stone was laid in the world's foundation. And this is no other than the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3, one who knows the deep things of God. For he was at the council table in heaven where all was transacted. This his Spirit he employed to put forth and publish in the Scripture indented to by him the substance of those counsels of love which had passed between the trinity of persons for our salvation, and that nothing may be wanting for our satisfaction. He hath appointed the same Holy Spirit to abide in his saints, that as Christ in heaven presents our desires to him, so he, leaving off on page 269, may interpret his mind out of his word to us, which word answers the heart of God, 
as face answers face in the glass. There is nothing desirable in a true friend as to this openness of heart. But God performs in a transcendent manner to his people. If any danger hangs over their heads, he cannot conceal it. By them, saith David, is thy servant warned. Speaking of the word of God, one messenger or other, God will send to give his saints the alarm, whether their danger be from sin within or enemies without. Hezekiah was in danger of inward pride. God sends a temptation to let him know what was in his heart, that he might, by falling once, be kept from falling again. Satan had a project against Peter. Christ gives him notice of it. Luke chapter 22. If any of his children by sin deceive him, he doth not, as false friends use, dissemble the displeasure he conceives, and carries it fair outwardly with them, while he keeps a secret grudge against them inwardly. No, he tells them roundly of it, and corrects them soundly for it, but entertains no ill will against them. And when he leads his people into an afflicted state, he loves them so, that he cannot leave them altogether in the dark concerning the thoughts of love he hath to them, in delivering them. But to comfort them in the prison doth open his heart beforehand to them, as we see in the grandest calamities that have befallen the Jewish church in Egypt and Babylon, as also the, the gospel church under Antichrist. The promises for the deliverance out of all these were expressed before the sufferings came. When Christ was on earth, how free and open was he to his disciples, both in telling them what calamity should befall them and the blessed issues of them all, when he should come again to them, and why, but to confirm them in the the persuasion of the sincerity of his heart towards them, as those words import, John chapter 14, If it were not so, I would have told you, as if he had said, It would not have consisted with the sincere love I bear to you to hide anything that is fit for you to know from you or make them otherwise than they are. And when he doth concealed any truths from them for the present, see his candor and sincerity opening the reason of his veiling them to be not that he grudged them the communication of them, but because they could not at present bear them. Now, Christian, improve all this to make thee more plain-hearted with God. Is he so free and open to thee, and wilt thou be so reserved to him? Doth thy God unbosom his mind to thee, and wilt not thou pour out all thy soul to him? Darest thou not trust him with thy secrets that makes thee privy to his counsels of love and mercy? In a word, darest thou to shame, go about to harbor and hide from him any treacherous lust in thy soul, whose love will not suffer him to conceal any danger from thee? God, who is so exact and true in the law of friendship with his people, expects the like ingenuity from them. Thirdly, the sincerity of God's heart and affection to his people appears in the unmovableness of his love, as there is no shadow of turning in the being of God, so not in the love of God to his people. There is no vertical point. His love stands still, like the sun in Gideon. It goes not down, nor declines, but continues in its full strength. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4. With everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Sorry man repents of his love, the hottest affection cools in his bosom. Love in the creature is like fire on the hearth, now blazing, anon blinking, and going out. But in God, like fire in the element that never fails, in the creature it is like water in a river that falls and rises. But in God, like water in the sea, that is always full and knows no ebbing or flowing. Nothing can take off his love. Where he hath placed it, it can neither be corrupted nor conquered. Attempts are made both ways, but in vain. First, his love cannot be corrupted. There hath been such that have dared to tempt God and court, yea, bribe the Holy One of Israel to desert and come off his people. Thus Balaam went to win God over to Balak's side against Israel, which to obtain he spared no cost, but built altar after altar and heaped sacrifice after sacrifice. Yea, what would they not have done to have gained but a word or two out of God's mouth against his people? But... He kept true to them, yea, left a branch of his displeasure upon that nation for hiring Balaam and sending him on such an errand to God. 
Deuteronomy 33, verse 4. This passage we find of God minding his people to continue in them a persuasion of his sincerity, steadfast love to them. Micah, chapter 6, verse 5. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam the son of Borah answered him from Shittim into Gilgal. And why should they remember this? That he may know the righteousness of the Lord, that is, that you may know how true and faithful a God I have been to you. Sometimes he makes use of it to provoke them to be sincere to him, as he in that proved himself to them. Jo uh, Joeth 24, verse 9. He tells them how Balak sent Balaam to set God a cursing them. But, saith the Lord, I would not hearken to him, but made him that came to curse you with his own lips and tale of blessing on you and yours. And why in this story mention? See verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. A most natural and reasonable inference from the premises of God's truth and faithfulness. O Christian, wouldest thou have thy love to God made incorruptible? Embalm it often in thy thoughts with the sweet spices of God's sincere love to thee, which is immortal and cannot see corruption. Believe God is true to thee, and be false to him if thou darest. It is a solix and bovarix in love to return falseness for faithfulness. Secondly, the love of God to his saints cannot be conquered. That which puts it hardest to it is not the power of his people's enemies, whether men or devils, but his people's sins. God makes nothing of their whole power and wrath when combined together, but truly the sins of his people. These put, uh, put omnipotency itself to the trial. We never hear God groaning under or complaining of the power of his enemies, but often sadly of his people's sins and unkindnesses. These load him. These break his heart, make him cry out as if he were at a stand in their thoughts, to use a human expression, and found it not easy what to do, whether love them or leave them, vote for their life or death. Well, whatever expressions God uses to make his people more deeply resent their unkindness shown to him, yet God is not at, at a loss what to do in this case. His love determines his thoughts in favor of his covenant people. When their carriage least deserves it. Hosea chapter 11 verse 9. The devil thought he had enough against Joshua when he could find some filth on his garment to carry this to in a tale and tell God what a dirty case his child was. He made just account to have said God against him. But he was mistaken, for instead of provoking him to wrath, he had moved him to pity. Instead of falling out with him, he finds Christ praying for him. Um, Zechariah chapter 3. Now, improve this in a mediation, meditation, Christian. Is the love of God so unconquerable that thy very sins cannot break or cut the knot of that covenant which ties thee to him? And does it not shame thee that thou shouldest be so fast and loose with him? Thou shouldest labor to have the very image of thy heavenly Father's love more clearly stamped in the face of thy love to him. As nothing can conquer his love to thee, so neither let anything prejudice thy love to him. Say to thy soul, Shall not I cleave close to God when he hides his face from me? Who hath not cast me off when I have sinfully turned my back on him? Shall not I give testimony of his truth and name, though others desert the one? and reproached the other, who hath kept love burning in his heart to me, when I have been dishonoring him. What? God. Yet on my side and gracious to me, after such backslidings as these, and shall I again grieve his spirit, and put his love to shame with more undutifulness? God forbid. This were to, to do my utmost to make God accessory to my sin by making his love fuel for it. Section 4. Fourthly, Beware of presumptuous sins. These grieve the deepest wound to uprightness, yea, are inconsistent with it. Psalms chapter 19, verse 13. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. One single act of presumption is inconsistent with the actual exercise of uprightness. As we see in David, who by that one foul sin of murder lost the present use of uprightness, and was in that particular too, like one of the fools in Israel, and therefore stands as the only exception to the general testimony which God gave uh, to his uprightness. First Kings chapter 15, verse 5. 
David did that which was upright in the eyes of the Lord, and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of uh, Uriah the Hittite. That is, there was no such presumption in any other sin committed by him, and therefore they are here discounted as to this, that they did not make such a breach on his uprightness as this one sin did. And as one act of a sin, presumptuous, is inconsistent with actual uprightness. The habitual uprightness is very hardly consistent with habitual presumption. If one act of a presumptuous sin, and as I may say uh, so, one sip of this poisonous cup does so sadly infect the spirit of a gracious person and change his complexion that he is not like himself. How deadly must it needs be to be uprightness to drink from day to day in it. And there... For as Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defy himself with the portion of the king's meat, Daniel 1.8, so do thou daily put thyself under some such holy bond, that thou wilt not defy thyself with any presumptuous sin. For indeed, this is properly the king's meat, I mean the devil's, the prince of darkness, who can himself commit none but presumptuous sins, and cheaply labors to defy souls, by eating of this his dish, say as Austin, in another case, I may err, but I am resolved not to be a heretic. I may have many failings, but by the grace of God I will labor that I be not a presumptuous sinner, and if thou wouldest not be in a presumptuous sin, take heed, thou makest not light of less infirmities. When David's heart smote him for rending the skirt of Saul, he stopped and made a happy retreat, his tender conscience giving him a private check, for rendering his skirt would not suffer him to cut his throat and take away his life, which was better than raiment. But at another time, when his conscience was more heavy-eyed and did not go to this friendly office to him, but let him shoot his amorous glances after Bathsheba without giving him any alarm of his danger, the good man like one whose senses are gone and the head dizzy at the first trip upon a steep hill, could not recover himself but tumbled from one sin to another, till at last he fell into the deep pit of murder. When the river is frozen, a man will venture to walk and run where he does not set his foot if the ice were but melted or broke. Or when the heart of a godly man himself is so hardened that he can stand on an infirmity, though never so light, and his conscience not crack under him, how far may he go? I tremble to think what sin he may fall into. Section 5. Fifthly, get above the love and fear of the world. The Christian sincerity is not eclipsed without the imposition of the interposition of earth between God and his soul. First, the love of the world, that this is a fit root for hypocrisy to grow upon. If the heart be violently set on anything the world hath, and it comes to vote, peremptorily for having it. I must be worth so much a year, have such honor, and the creature begins with Ahab, to be sick with longing after them. Then the man is in great danger to take the first ill counsel that Satan or the flesh gives him for obtaining his ends, though prejudicial to his uprightness. Hunters mind not the way they go in, over hedge and ditch they leap, so they may have the hair. It is a wonder, I confess, that any saint should have so strong a scent after the creature that hath the savor of Christ's ointment poured into his bosom. One would think the sweet perfume which comes so hot from those beds of spices, the promises, would spoil the Christian's hunting game after the creature in one scent should hinder the taking in the other, the pure sweetnesses that breathe from Christ in heaven in them should so fill the Christian senses that the other enjoyments, being of a more gross and earthly savor, should find no pleasing resentment in his nostrils, which indeed is most true and certain, so long as the Christian hath his spiritual senses open and in exercise, but alas, as upon some cold in his body the head is stopped and the senses bound up from doing their office, so through the Christian's negligence a spiritual distemper is easily got, whereby those senses, graces I mean, which should judge of things are sadly obstructed. And now when the Christian is not in temper for enjoying 
these pure sweetnesses, the devil hath a fair advantage of starting some creature enjoyment and presenting it before the Christian, which the flesh soon sense and carries the poor Christian after it, till grace comes a little in its temper, and then he gives over the chase with shame and sorrow. Secondly, get above the fear of the world. The fear of man brings a snare. A coward may run into any hole, though ever so dishonorably. So he may save himself from what he fears. And when the holiest are under the power of this temptation, they are too like other men. Abraham, in a pang of fear, dissembles with Amalek. Yet Peter, when not his life but his reputation seemed to be in little danger, did walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. He did not put it right as became so holy a man to do, but took one step forward and another back again, as if he had not liked his way. Now he will eat with the Gentiles, and, and now he withdraws. Now what made him dissemble, and his feet thus double in his going? Nothing but the qualm of fear that came over his heart, as you may see, Galatians 2.12, compared with verse 14, fearing them that were of the circumcision he disassembled and drew others into a party with him. Section 6. Sixthly and lastly, keep a strict eye over thy own heart in thy daily walking. Hypocrisy is a weed with which the best soil is so tainted that it needs daily care and dressing to keep it under. He that rides on a stumbler had need have his eye on his way and hand on his bridle. Such is thy heart, Christian, yea, it often stumbles in the fairest way. When thou least fears it. Look to it, therefore, and keep a strict rein over it. Above all, keeping keep the heart. Proverbs 4.23. The servant keeps his way when he travels in his master's company. But when sent off an errand alone, then he hath his agories. Many a weary step may be prevented in extravagancies in the daily walking. Didst thou walk in company with thyself? I mean, observe thyself and way. In this sense, most of the world are besides themselves strangers to their own walking as much as to their own faces. Everyone that lives with them knows them better than themselves, which is a horrible shame. And let not so vain an opinion find place with thee, that because sincere thou needest not keep so strict an eye over thy heart, as if thy heart, which is gracious, could not play false with God in thee too. Does not Solomon brand him on the forehead for a fool that trusts his own heart? If thou art, as thou sayest, sincere, I be cannot believe self-love should so far prevail with thee. They are the ignorant and profane, whose hearts are stark not, which cry them up for good. But it is one part of the goodness of a heart made truly good by grace to see more into and complain more of its own naughtiness. Bring thy heart, therefore, often upon the review, and take it to count solemnly. He takes the way to make his servant a thief, that doth not ask him now and then what money he hath in his hand. I read indeed of some in good uh, dead days that were trusted with the money for the repair of the temple, with whom they did not so much as reckon how they laid it out, for they dealt faithfully. Second Kings 12.15 but thou hadst not be thus to do so with thy heart, lest it set thee on score with God and thy own conscience, more than thou wilt get waped out in haste. Many talents God puts into thy hand, health, liberty, Sabbaths, ordinances, communion of saints, and the like, for the repair of thy spiritual temple, the work of grace in thee. Ask now thy soul how every one of these are laid out, Maybe thou wilt find some of this money spent, and the work never a whit the more for it. It stands thee in hand to look to it, for God will have an account, though thou art favorable to thy deceitful heart to call for none. End of chapter 14, having been read by Peter John Parisis.